Firstly, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners uh, that we meet on today. It's a wonderful privilege to be able to sit here with this panel um, and to discuss the topic of who speaks, um, self-determination and cultural resilience. Um, I'd just like to welcome to the stage uh, Mao Ishawaki, sorry, forgive me, Ishkawa, sorry. Hi! They're going to help me out today. Kathy Chin of Kitchener, sorry. Latai Toma Piao, thank you. And Jerome Manjat. Can you please welcome them? I'd start off with um, a description of what is self-determination, uh, a process by, by which a person controls their own life. And cultural resilience, a culture's capacity to maintain and develop cultural identity and critical cultural knowledge and practices. Um, we all enter this space with our own experiences, our own cultures and our own histories. Some good, some bad. Um, our stories are always changing, they're moving, we, we actually exchange stories, we share stories. Um, many stories are not told and so I think we are left with the decision about what stories do we tell, how do we tell them and how do people hear them. So I want the panel to do the talking today. So I might start with uh, everybody, and uh, I'll start with you, Cathy, just if you could introduce yourself and uh, where you're from. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Cathy Jedengar Gutjener. Um, I'm from the Marshall Islands, and before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the, the owners of the land. Um, it's a really beautiful land, and it's been uh, an, an honour and a privilege to learn more about it and the people who own this land. Uh, throughout this journey. Um, so just anything about, okay. Um, so I'm, I, I, I am Marshallese, um, uh, but I was raised in Hawaii, in the US, and so I have a very Americanized background. Most of my training has been in writing. Um, I don't have any formal artistic training. Uh, I have, uh, perf my, the most performance training I do have is uh, spoken word. And so what, I'm no, what my work has always been on is um, using poetry and performance and spoken word performances specifically to raise awareness on issues impacting Marshall Islands and Marshallese community, which is um, nuclear testing, climate change. And so my world and my realm has always been limited to uh, conferences. And I was always kind of a bookend sort of performer. And um, uh, I... I I, get, I got a lot more recognition when I performed at the United Nations Climate Summit, and that sort of launched my career into spaces that, where Marshallese, a young Marshallese young woman, like wouldn't normally be in, and a spoken word artist wouldn't normally be in. And so this ABT9 is my first really real kind of expansion and uh, exploration of performance as art that you know goes beyond a poem, a three-minute poem. And so um, besides that, I run a nonprofit back home in the Marshall Islands that's dedicated to working with Marshallese youth um, and tra giving trainings for on environmental issues, which is why I actually really connected with the speaker before, and um, I would love to talk more after. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I, and I also work with a nonprofit based in Hawaii that develops curriculum, Pacific Resources for Education and Learning, and uh, I think that's it. Oh. Yeah, I'm currently based in Oregon, but I travel back and forth often to the Marshall Islands to run my organization. Fantastic. Yeah. Jerome? Hello, my name is Jerome. I'm from Sabah, Malaysia. Uh, I'm a part of the collective called Pan Rock Sulap. Um, yeah, what else to talk? <laughs> 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 okay, that's it. We can talk about <laughs> that. Latai? Malay. My name is Latai Tamwebeau. Latai means to reminisce. Tamwebeau uh, means to battle with waves. It's a 
title that was bestowed on my ancestor. He was a celestial navigator and it is my last name. Um, uh, I also make sacred and acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, my practice is um, in Fiverr. Fiverr in the Tongan language um, literally translates to due time and space. Um, but Fiverr is also body-centred practice in social obligation and can mean a game, a task, a film or performance. And so celestial, celestial navigation is also um, in the practice of Fiverr. Um, I predominantly make work uh, around the impact of climate change um, on the region, um, particularly vulnerable communities who are already impacted by climate change. Um, and one of... Uh, and you can read my bio, it's in there, that I wrote that for MySpace a long time ago and I think it's still relevant, even though MySpace <laughs> isn't. <laughs> um, I just want to quickly tell you about one of my favourite performances that I did a f few years ago. I uh, can't even remember when, but um, it was at the Australian Museum during a um, conference, a Pacific conference, and um, I was... Uh, going to do a performance during lunch and um, I had just returned from Tonga where, uh, from a, co a UNESCO conference where the um, royal archivalists um, were doing a workshop on how to wrap a body um, in bark cloth for burial and I thought it would be really cool to share this new um, knowledge that I had. So um, during lunch, uh, I had my cousins wrap me in this, in this bark cloth and carry me into the middle of the lunch room. And um, slowly I started to unravel um, from this giant bark cloth kebab in the middle of the room. <laughs> <It's so awesome. laughs> and um, the task was to un... Uh, to open up the whole bark cloth, which was approximately 50 feet long. And this, these pieces of bark cloth... Well, this piece of bark cloth is made by um, groups of women. Well, actually, all bark cloth is made by groups of women and um, from the mulberry bark. And um, it's ceremonial cloth. It's used for all sorts of things. Um, so in the lunch room... Uh, during lunch, um, I was in the middle of the room and... I unraveled without um, exposing my body and but showing this entire 50 foot piece of um, bark cloth um, which has beautiful designs um, on it and bark cloth is also one of the ways that we document our history um, through design. Um, and so then after that, uh, being under this bark cloth, I started like convulsing and shaking and making this uh, bark cloth move through the room and then suddenly like it just came up I, like pushed it around the room and kicked it and slammed it against the floor and um and then I took out my white gloves and put them on my hands and then nicely folded it back up and walked out the door and um <laughs> I don't know what performance they were expecting but this was something that I felt that I really needed to um, perform in the museum because I thought there are some very valuable um, possessions of the museum which I really appreciate but I also wanted to just say in that performance that it these this culture is alive it's living and if we want to destroy it we will and we can um, and um, I just thought that kind of describes a little yeah. bit more about my practice and how I manoeuvre through the institutions as well as public spaces through, the, through that. Thank you, thank you. Mal? Hi. Hi. <laughs> how are you? I'm fine. Uh, Would you like to introduce yourself? By myself? Yes, please. Okay. I try. Because uh, I speak English. <laughs> but I try, okay? Um, my name is Mao Ishikawa. I come from uh, between Taiwan and Japan. Then my, I have a uh, passport of Japan, but I'm not a Japanese. I am a Okinawan. 
I have a big pride over Okinawa. Don't call me Japanese. I am a Okinawan. <laughs> <laughs> Many, many years ago, uh, Okinawa, Okinawa name is uh, not Okinawa, Kingdom of Ryuchu, Kingdom of Ryuchu, not Okinawa. But in 1879, uh, in 1879, Okinawa was in the, <laughs> she told me, she teached me, yeah. Okinawa was in the, <laughs> In, in debate, in debate um, by Japan. <laughs> so since now, since now, Japanese people think, uh, Japanese government think, uh, we are not the Japanese. We are Okinawa, and the rank is down. Uh, like a no dear child, stepchild, like that. You understand what I say? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, many years ago, Japan come and uh, change name. Now, many, many American soldiers stay in my island, my island, uh, from, from 1945, after uh, start uh, American soldier came to Okinawa. So until now, American soldier never back to states. Who is American? <laughs> I want you, 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 want, you take uh, your military from my island. Please back to island. No, America. Please, you do this. <laughs> we don't want no more America. Never America. But, uh, Japanese, Japanese government don't listen. And American military don't listen. Hey, who, who, am, who am I? Who are, who are, who are Okinawa? Eh? Okay, 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 okay. Okinawa is ours, not Americans, not Japanese. Okinawa Island is our island. Oh. Make me tired. Yes. Thank you. Um, I suppose it, I haven't really introduced myself properly, which is pretty bad. Um, I am an Australian South Sea Islander. I'm, also, I'm a curator too, but I, I'm firstly an Australian South Sea Islander. And my story is my family is connected to Vanuatu. My history is like connected to the blackbirding of South Sea Islanders from the islands of Vanuatu, Solomons, Kiribati, New Ireland and PNG, New Caledonia, um, over 150 years ago. I am third generation uh, Australian and I don't think my ancestors ever thought I'd be sitting on a stage talking about self-determination um, in front of an audience like this with um, my colleagues here. So uh, it certainly is an experience, but I must say, it's an ex in my work as uh, an Australian South Sea Islander, I'm, I'm not Indigenous to this place, although we have strong connections, and we're not Indigenous to the Pacific either, so, you know, we sort of sit in this no-man's land, so we have to find our own identity in this space. Um, and we work with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters because um, there are many connections there and our connections to the Pacific. But how do we create this identity in this space and to reclaim our own stories when our stories have been written about for 150 years? Um, so this is something I'm really uh, passionate about. But sometimes we don't fit... Uh, we don't fit here and we don't fit uh, in the Pacific, especially when we were just talking about things about funding. Sometimes we don't fit in either area. But I'm interested to talk about um, how we talk about art, but we talk about culture, and how does it fit in these institutional, uh, in big institutions like this and the museum. Um, unsettled, we certainly experienced... Um, it was challenging for the museum um, to incorporate arts into its practice, well, 
into delivering it. Whereas as culture and from a curatorial point of view with a cultural background, I see that it is all one. I see culture as one and the borders of government and borders of institutions sometimes uh, prohibit that um, unless you have friends, which is great. But I just wanted to actually open it up to the panel to talk about uh, how, and I might speak to you first, Cathy, about how do you see, we, we spoke about your artwork here, mm -hmm. in your performance here in this space. Um, could you just speak to how you feel about performing in this space and mm -hmm. how you, you feel your work is here? Um, yeah, I can. Uh, so I'm, like I said, it's, I, it's, this, is, this is kind of new to me. Um, but what I do enjoy about it is that I'm so used to writing for campaigns, like writing to, okay, I'm going to help support this treaty against nuclear weapons. How do I write a poem that raises awareness on this within three minutes? And then I can create a video. Let me figure out a way to create a video that's mm -hmm. like about a journey to a nuclear waste site. Like, you know, these are all very... It's always very with a specific like goal in mind of of you know um, of supporting something, but uh, working within that activist realm, it can have limitations, you know. Where uh, and what I like about being in this space is that you know uh, when I was working with Ruha and the curators, um, they were very like uh, Ruha and Ruth were very much like what it is, what is it that you want to do, and and then there, it was sort of limitless, and I'm not really used to that. And so that's where it, I really enjoyed feeling like I could push it a little bit more. I could push performance. I could push poetry. I can um, explore different realms and, and maybe not have a, an ending that is neatly tied up in a bow and have you know, audiences feel like, OK, I got what that was about. You know? And so what I was exploring with my performance here was the connection between climate change and women's identities and trauma. Um, from abuse in um, in the Marshall Islands, and this is something that I I haven't really figured out yet. Like I I'm still trying to articulate it, and I'm still trying to understand it. But this was my first performance, trying to tie it together and explore that without having an answer. Um, and so that's where I really enjoyed it, and I, mm -hmm. I enjoyed my time um, doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that answer? Your question? Yeah, that does yeah, answer okay. my question. Um, how about you, Jerome? Um, <clears throat> it's been honored to be here. Uh, I never thought that I'm going to sit down here and talk with the, you guys. Uh, I'm not very comfortable with speaking in English, but I will try. Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't introduce myself well also. Okay. Um, Pang Rock Sulap is a collective. We are... Um, um, a few bunch of people that, young people, that didn't have an uh, artist background. We just like key, uh, a youth that want to have fun, and yeah, and we love music. We do music all the time. Uh, what we do in our life for this collective is we create. Uh, we work with all the communi communities in our space, in our place in Sabah. So um, we try to like rewrite the narrative of the village, and we collect all that, and then we share to everyone. Um, what else? <laughs> and do you find that perhaps? How do you feel about, how is it exhibiting outside of Malaysia compared to exhibiting in Malaysia? It's a very big difference. Um, yeah, this is the first time I was in Australia. Uh, the crowd is different than, yeah. <laughs> um, here, I think uh, it's more open mm -hmm. and you can, you can do whatever you want, I think. Yeah. But in my place, there's a limitation. Uh, I think it's a taboo maybe in my country that you cannot speak the truth. So 
Uh, the work that we bring here uh, for the APT is uh, one of the story about my country, uh, Sabah State. Uh, it's about um, how to say that the dream and nightmare, uh, the things that I think every country have. Um, uh, how to say? Uh, same experience, like the one that you know. Uh, for example, like people know only the good stuff, but the bad things, like the hidden part, they didn't really know. So mm -hmm. that's what we bring here. And yeah. um, thank you for having us here uh, and exhibit the work again okay. because it was banned last year. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh -huh. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk more about that. Um, uh, Jerome's collective had uh, their work censored last year, and we'll come to that because I think these are some of the boundaries and um, that we don't, you know, that happen in other countries, but are very real to our, all our own experiences. Um, and that is a political one, but there are also invisible ones. And I'd like to touch on that a little later, if that's OK, Jerome. Right. Matai, how do you feel about performing um, your work in um, these cultural institutions? Um, well, I, I, um, I always en enjoy not just presenting, but the process um, of developing uh, ideas and imagining the possibilities um, in institutions like this. Um, uh, although it's, it's often difficult, um, one as a performance maker, you know, not have, you know, being from another, living in another place and, you know, so generally would rehearse in this place. So, you know, those are some of the logistical problems. But also I tend to often um, have to go through a process of communicating with engineers and getting approval from doctors and all this sort of thing, which is <laughs> really annoying. Uh, but it, it's what happens. Um, I, th I think one of the things that I really loved is yesterday watching the um, Kiribati community um, performing and there was a, a, the youngest member of that community was in costume and amongst her, her family and, you know, and she had this gigantic camera around her neck and she started taking photos of other people and I really loved that gaze of her watching people, watching her people. And um, it reminded me of my very first performance in my village, which was seven. Uh, I was, no, I was six. And, um, you know, and it reminded me that that's how we learn um, from our people is it's through being present, participating, copying, you know, or being dressed yeah. for the occasion. Um, and similarly to the, the really important ceremony that happened on the first day amongst all the First Nations artists, which is, uh, you know, very, a very new thing to um, negotiate space. Uh, yes, we are in, in Goma, the institution, but beyond that is the space that we're sharing as First Nations people. And in order for that to happen properly and safely, um, people need to introduce themselves in a way that um, introduces their ancestry to each other, introduces, um, you know, collectives of people. I mean, I, I, I was by myself. No, my sister is here, actually, biological sister. So... Um, one of the things as a performance maker that I really love about observing ceremony is that, yes, it's staged, um, but it's also instructive at the same time. So we're all learning at the same time, you know. The elders tell the young people what to do. If you get it wrong, you just get corrected. It's, you know, so the backstage is also exposed to everybody. Mm. You know, this yeah. cultural um, way of transmitting knowledge um, 
has a functional and practical um, application, but it's also very unique to all the people that are here in this space and time, and we know now what it means to negotiate ourselves within in this space. And that's a performative practice, that's culture, that's arts, that's mm. living, that's life, you know. And so it means to witness something very unique to this moment in time, which is really, really special. Um, and I also love... Um, there's, of course, there's the scheduling and the you know, everything in the program, but the in-between time is this really expansive space where all sorts of things happen between... Um, in ..interaction between people that's really rich um, and that's, that, you know, yeah. that's what it means to, to gather together with, with a unique group of people from the Asia-Pacific region. Yeah. Um, and I imagine sometimes that this happened, you know, for many people from our respective ancestries. Yes. So I think we're just continuing on yes. what they do, what they did, yes. what we do. What we do. Hi, Mal. Me? Yes. <laughs> OK, I try. If I cannot do, please. OK, I become a... Can you hear me? Yes. OK. I became a photographer. I was 20 years, two zero years old. Now, uh, 45 years passed already. Me is look young, but uh, my age is 65 <laughs> years. So long time, many years. Always I try uh, make uh, Japanese people make understand about Okinawa people's fear. So I try, 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 but now I'm very tired. <laughs> I don't wanna do no more anymore. I'm very tired. So now, uh, mm, uh, I forgot uh, when, but uh, first time I, uh, my exhibition at the uh, other country, America, at Europe, I forgot the name, Shun. So anyway, uh, other countries, people is watch my, look my uh, photo, and they straight, uh, what they think. They say, oh, beautiful, oh, uh, what's the English? Oh, ano, subarashi to ka kando shita te nan you know? Wonderful, or it moved me. Amusement. It moved me. It was moving. Mo was moving. <laughs> so anyway, oh, why so straight they say so? Why Japanese say Japanese close the eye? Oh, this is Okinawa uh, photo. Tun, no, no see. Close the eyes. But the other countries people, they told me too. They told me straight. Wow. I stop uh, try make understand make understand Japanese. I must go to other countries more better for me. And uh, if other countries people say my photo is okay, then come to this news come to Japan. Then Japanese people say, oh, so Mao's photo is so good. <laughs> oh, <it is>. <laughs> 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 So the opinion, the opinion is then imported. So as a result of that, my my opinions get re-imported into Japan. Oh, you understand? Yes. 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 Japanese people is so easy. <laughs> so don't think by themselves. Oh, always they uh, they believe just Japanese government number ten government too. Make me angry or tired. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this time, first time I came to here at Australia's uh, museum. Then before I never, I never, uh, I do, I don't care other artists, other hot, uh, photographers, what they do, what they think. I didn't care because uh, I I was so busy, 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 busy. Always I take Okinawa people's life 
very busy. I, I'm not interested about the uh, other photograph of uh, uh, Japanese, other countries, don't care. Always I think by, always I take me, my photo. But I came here uh, this time, first time, then my photo exhibition, first time. Okay, uh, my photo uh, go to uh, uh, Museum of America, and uh, where, I forgot. So the museum buy my photos, big, big, uh, big, nandatta uh, bijusukan. Hey, huh? It's not bijusukan. What do you mean? Huh? Oh, museum. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's it. But uh, no talk, no exhibition. Not it. So this time, open the uh, my photo is exhibition, and this is a symposium. Before I have. I have a chance, many, 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 many chance, uh, exhibition and uh, symposium, but only in Okinawa, in Japan, not in other country, first time. So I watch, 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 I see, 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 other artists art. So make me shock, 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 because uh, they think about uh, what I think, uh, they think, uh, same, same area, same, same. Because uh, they don't like uh, big, big power. <laughs> Go uh, get away, get my way. That the show. So yeah. I'm right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, oh, my friend. <laughs> why I never see other countries a uh, photographer. Wow, I lost the time. Then I am a photographer. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a what? Act, act, visit, act, visit? I am only photographer, just photographer. I like photograph. I don't want to try other, other things, other, other art, other action. Just I take pictures of Okinawa people, I want to show to everybody. So they think too, they think the same, same uh, my idea, uh, oh, mm. anyway, anyway. So I like them, I like one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I talk a I talk, uh, little bit, little bit time, but uh, I, I'm not a foolish, mm. I'm a very smart woman. Mm. Not, 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 I cannot speak English. But I'm smart. Yes. I think so. Yes. They are very nice. Yes. They my 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 thing, same same. Mm. So now I think, oh, I must think I must think about uh, something. It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> but I like their art. Mm. I never say oseji. Oseji te nanti you. Compliments. Uh -huh. huh? Compliment. <laughs> Company. Mm -hmm. I never say that. Always I say true. Mm -hmm. You are very nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, one thing I'm always interested in is um, the process, uh, in, you know, that people go through to create work, but also um, how do people incorporate uh, cultural knowledge within their practices. So I know when we did Unsettle with Digi Youth Arts, I was very privileged to be a part of some of the uh, mentorship um, that Digi Youth Arts was offering to the um, younger artists and also bringing in elders to that and, and enabling um, the young people to to also discover, you know, their cultural identity at the same time. So I just want to know how does cultural identity influence the work that you do and what's that process that you go through? Um, and, I, and 
what are some of those things that we don't normally talk about that we have to go through to be able to do that, to get that authority to be able to speak and do what we do? Maybe I'll, I'll start with um, you, Jerome. Okay. Um, yeah, basically, we start with the music. <laughs> How to connect with the um, communities. I always say that communities, because I, we always work with the villagers. Uh, we are village, I mean, I'm a camp, um, can I say kampung? Yes. You know kampung? Yeah, village boy. So I think I like that. I mean, mm. So how do we um, work with them? Is, is we live, like, if there's a thing that we think we need to have for the village, so we will go to that place. Like, we just go. We bring our friend, whoever is available at that time, and we just straight away to that village, and we live with the villagers. And talk to them, have fun, uh, ask a lot of questions, especially their narrative, like, what is their past, and uh, how to say this? Uh, yeah. So, because you had the video of oh yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, do you want to talk people through the video? What's in the video? Oh yeah, uh, you should talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do well. Um, so when we have everything. We will decide, like, um, uh, I'm a bit blur how to speak. Mm. You speak to elders during yeah. your process? Yeah, during the process, normally we will speak to the elders and uh, we ask whether they will allow us to uh, create those kind of history, uh, their history. So if they allowed us, then we create. Um, how do we create? We uh, use um, wood block, um, wood cut. Uh, we do wood block print. So um, in one week, the process is always one week. So in the one week days, we will create the things. Uh, I mean, create the artwork together with the villagers. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, the result will be very surprising. Mm -hmm. uh, we will... So do you know the story before you go in there? No. no. Basically, we don't have idea what we are going to have there. So, mm -hmm. so we just go and meet to the people and spoke with them. Mm -hmm. After that, then we will, uh, yeah, working together. Yeah. For the works, yeah, and then after we manage to have the work, um, we just celebrate, like before we, um, because basically uh, the size that we do for the villagers is like um, eight times four feet of wood block, mm -hmm. and it involves a lot of. Like villagers, I mean, a lot of people working together in an one block print. And instead of, because we don't have enough material, I think, like machine, uh, we just dance on it, <sighs> dance on the print oh, that we made. Because you don't have a presser. Yeah, yeah. we don't okay. have a presser, so we just dance. Wow. Uh, to music. Yeah, with make? the music. <laughs> the villagers who do the music. Oh, fantastic. There. And then yeah. uh, everyone must dance after this finish. Mm -hmm. Then we just, yeah, assemble. And most of the time, the result will surprise everyone, yeah. even, yeah. Even you. Yeah. So, fantastic. 
Okay. That's good. That's... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. And Catherine, how about um, did you do a workshop with, oh, yeah. with um, uh, when creating your piece? You learned um, how to weave. Or? Oh, I did. Yes. So oh, I totally almost forgot. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I took a, a. So I spent three weeks. So when when they initially approached me and said, you know, what would you want to do for this performance? I said I wanted to learn how to weave, um, a traditional form of weaving called jagier, which is using a really fine fibers and it's a traditional form of weaving that's just been kind of brought back recently and um, so I spent three weeks with some elders um, and master weavers uh, and they were all weaving mats for this exhibition and I was learning alongside them and um, and so yeah I spent three weeks doing that and then uh, and then another part of the practice was exploring legends and so for me w with writing it always starts with legends like what legend am I going to focus mm -hmm. on and so the legends that I have been drawn to lately are specifically um, legends of, of demon women. Um, so the Medianwar, which is a Marshallese woman demon that was believed to, uh, that kind of originates from women um, after they give birth. And we now think it's an explanation for postpartum depression, actually. Okay. But it's, cool. um, it's a woman demon that, uh, it's a woman who becomes a demon after she gives birth. And if she's alone for too long, then she becomes a demon. That's the belief. And so when I, even when I gave birth, when I gave birth to my daughter, you know, like a lot of my aunties would be like, you, you can't be alone or else you'll become a medianwar, you know. And the idea is, the, and the woman demon has shark teeth in the back of her head. Okay. Her head can stretch around an entire island and she consumes her own child and also consumes children and people and men. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one legend that I really like. Um, because I can connect to that sort of pain, but also because um, cause, cause she's cool. Like, I just yeah, really yeah. like, cool. yeah. Because yeah. I'm like, we that's like that, cool. Right? Yeah, I kind of yeah. like horror and yeah. creepy stuff, and I was like, <laughs> this is cool. So I really like it. And then um, the other part, the, another legend woman that I decided to explore this time around was the Lerro, which is another legend woman, and it's an affliction like um, that, that we believe. Like, if a woman, uh, if a man leaves the, this woman, then she gets so overwhelmed with grief. Like if she, it's like usually a loss of a lover or loss of a child. When she's so overwhelmed with grief that she becomes, um, she gains the ability to fly, and then she gets to fly. She can fly everywhere. And um, there's a lot of cases where women have turned into lerro after either you know their husbands left them or some other issue. And so um, yeah, so that was those were the two legends I decided to focus on and embody for the performance. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of it, and so before, bef while I'm doing research on those legends, I always make sure to talk to elders within the community and get their opinion. So um, these are separate from the elders I learned weaving from. And then, and then the other elders I went to to talk to specifically about the legends and get permission to talk about it. Because some of these Medianwar and Lerro are actually based on real women. And so mm -hmm. I have to be really careful with that, you know, because you don't want to... Because one, it's, it might be disrespectful to the family, and then two, you might be embodying some really, some like spirit, and mm. like a real, like, and that can be obviously dangerous to mm. me spiritually. And so, um, yeah, and, uh, and then, yeah, so those yeah. were, yeah, it was weaving workshop, but yes. that was the biggest one, was weaving, was learning how to actually, so it's important for me to actually like touch, not just like, watch and witness and interview weavers, but actually learn how to weave, like a part of that, I need that tangible experience to be, to really inform the performance. Yes, yeah. yes, yep. Yeah. Um, Latoya, how about you? Um, how does your cultural identity inform your work? or participate in your work, perhaps? Because I don't want to just naturally assume that you're doing a cultural performance. Like, you know, culture does play a part in the work that we do, but not necessarily is the informative part, but yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, I, um, I have this thing that I say, and I'm saying it more and more often, um, because it helps me understand what I do. Um, and other people as well. 
um, and to, yeah, I'm really glad that Alethea brought up uh, non-linear time and cyclical time because I feel that's what where my practice sits. So my, I, I say this thing, um, the more ancient I am, the more contemporary my work mm. is. And that's um, because my cultural heritage is at the centre of my practice. This came about coming out of the institution and unlearning everything that I spent a whole lot of time putting into my body. And when I started to uh, make work and even try to um, have, a, have the courage to have a solo practice because performance work from most people it, from the cultures in the region is collective work. Mm. So I was freaked out by the thought of even having a solo practice. So there are lots of ways that I have to think about it so I don't feel like yeah. I'm working by myself. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yes, there's a centering of uh, my Indigenous uh, methodologies in my practice because I think that form is political. And so I have tried to unlearn, and I deliberately don't call it a decolonising process, um, because Western, the Western canon um, is not at the centre of my practice. Mm -hmm. it, that's just it. So it has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. It's my Indigenous um, structures, which we call culture, is at the centre of that. Um, so maybe I, I'll talk a little bit about the performance that I did at opening night, um, which was called The Odyssey or Fehuluni. And Fehuluni uh, was a deity, Tongan deity. And um, I was, what this performance was, was an imagining um, beyond a legend that um, is known in my culture, which is the story of Fehuluni and Seketoa, um, which I googled and found on the internet. Um, because I make work um, that is about uh, uh, climate change, um, climate justice, climate action, which I also see as a campaign. Um, I don't differentiate it just because it's in the arts that it's not a, a campaign or it's not um, political. It's, it is because my body is at the centre of it. My body is political. And so when I may, well, when um, I started thinking about the performance for opening night, I wanted to make something that is, and I, this is also true for the, all of my performances, something um, that is uh, in a continuation, a continuum of why performance exists in my Indigenous um, culture. And that is because we, we, because we uh, didn't have a written language, performance, song, poetry, all of it is body, uh, part of the body, uh, an expression of the body. And the function of it is to um, document time, document, tell stories, um, pass on knowledge, transmit knowledge from this time to that time. So I think of my practice as doing the same thing, but about issues that are relevant to us today. Mm -hmm. um, so I also don't always use the vocab vocabulary from my cultural traditions um, or heritage. I don't even like using the word tradition. Um, but, yeah, the story of um, the, the performance was based on a legend that I think is about power struggle. Um, it was potentially about the arrival of patriarchy and so I wanted to contextualise my performance in um, the framework of climate change, um, and not just climate change, it's so, that's just so broad, but um, uh, contextualise it in how we are dealing with the environmental issues of today, which I feel is really paternalistic. So that performance was intended to be a ritualistic killing of patriarchy by having Fehuluni, uh, um, my interpretation of Fehuluni, which was realised through my costume, which was a collaboration with Matthew Stegg. 
um, in Sydney, and it was this idea of Fehuluni returning to this time and and um, offering a, another way of approaching climate action because whatever we're doing is way too slow um, and it's not really working and I think it's because it's um, patriarchal. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Thank you.